and I'm the subscriber products editor here at The Chronicle. And I'm thrilled to be in conversation today with Drew Faust, who has just published a really captivating memoir. Drew is an American historian who served as president of Harvard University from 2007 to 2018, the first woman to serve uh, in that role. Before she was president of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study after serving 25 years on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania. She's the author of six books, and a finalist for the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. Her new memoir, Necessary Trouble, Growing Up at Mid-Century, is vivid and personal, and she weaves the events of her early years between robust historical context in a way that only a historian can. Drew examines a narrow but formative period of her life, from her childhood in a privileged conservative family to her high school years in a New England boarding school where her rebellion from Southern society's expectations found new purpose in civil rights activism. It ends as she graduates from college in 1968, entering a society grappling with racial inequality, the Vietnam War, and new questions about the role of women. Drew, we're so thrilled to have you with us here today. Thank you, Laura, it's great to be here. In the book, you write a lot about the women in your life, uh, who shaped you from a very early age. Um, there was, of course, your mother who conformed to the social norms of the South in 1950s and uh, who kind of gave up her own hopes and dreams in service of her family. In many ways, your youth was shaped by your rebellion against her expectations. Um, and then there was Mrs. Hall. She was the headmistress of your uh, boarding school and one of the first women who really expanded your thinking about what was possible for your own life. Uh, you describe her as a combination of Socrates and General Patton. And uh, you talk about how she saw a potential in you before you even really saw it uh, yourself. And so I was wondering if you could talk about the role um, of female role models in your life and your career. I'm specifically thinking of any other higher ed leaders who are who are out there, uh, women who might be aspiring to leadership. That's such a, a wonderful question, because when I was growing up in Virginia, there really weren't role models for any path except motherhood and, and um, domesticity. And so people like my mother and her friends did not give me many alternatives to the way their lives were structured. And for me, watching my mother, who was really a very unhappy person, and, and you know that from reading the book, and then seeing my grandmother, who was a force in many ways, but similarly constrained within a set of expectations in the 1950s, and also a, an unhappy person, I wanted a different, a different set of possibilities to to come before my eyes. And so I actually, I have a chapter in the book where I talk about I, how I didn't have role models as a child and found them in books and reading about Nancy Drew, for example, or Anne Frank's extraordinary self um, awareness and her adolescent insights, uh, and then scout into Kill a Mockingbird. I think I found um, the possibility of getting out of the world that my mother and grandmother had been so miserable in through, through reading books. But then, as you say, when I encountered Mrs. Hall, here was a woman who was so strong and such a um, influence on the lives of the, it was an all girls school, on the lives of the girls in, in that school, Concord Academy. And she put on no airs. I mean, she drove a tractor to try to make a skating rink for the school. And she, helped take a building down board by board in New Hampshire to move to the Massachusetts campus uh, to be the chapel. And there's a picture of her on a ladder with a hammer in the book. This wasn't the genteel Southern lady that I had been trained to be. And she also gave us these very moral exhortations in regularly, regular, beautifully delivered speeches. And we found that inspiring. It made us think, oh, we have to be better people. We have to to really reach her expectations. And she once took me aside and, and kind of, it was a little bit of a chastisement. Like, you can be a lot better than you are. And I thought, okay, she's, she's noticing me. That's so important. But I also talk in the book and Laura, I think this is important to say, Mrs. Hall, 
At the same time, she embodied what one would think of as a liberated woman and a powerful woman. Part of what she told us is that our expectations should not go beyond recognizing that we would be likely subordinated to our husbands and that we wouldn't have careers because it would be their careers that mattered. So we got very mixed messages from her, except I think we all saw the powerful one. And so that's what won out in all of our minds. You asked about uh, women leaders in higher education also, and I was thinking about that as you, as you asked a question. I went to a women's college and there were uh, faculty members there who had achieved remarkable things in terms of academic accomplishments and writing and recognition. And some of those women were important path, uh, pointed to important directions forward for me. Mary Dunn was one of those women. She ended up being president of Smith and, and head of the American Philosophical Society. She taught me history and uh, believed in everything women could do was an overt feminist and a, and a great role model. And then a, another role model for me is someone who's only a year older than I am, but took on a presidency role uh, well before I did. And that's Shirley Tillman, uh, who is the president of Princeton, a person of eminent good sense, fairness, wisdom, just a terrific person who was the first woman president of Princeton. So I'll put her name in the hat as well as a person who's been a role model and a, and a real star, I think, in, in the higher education sphere. Yeah. You also spend a lot of time in the book. And I thought this was fascinating, describing these summer activism trips that you took uh, in high school. Um, so this was, the first one was to East Germany during the Cold War. And the second was across the Southern states in those volatile months right after the Civil Rights Act passed in 1964. Um, and so in some ways they sort of felt like a journey from a different era, right? You're a group of students and chaperones riding around on a VW bus, like singing along to guitar, you know, folk songs and trying to promote peace and understanding. And <laughs> at the same time, right? Like you had this incredible front row view on some of the, uh, you know, most important sort of struggles, social struggles and conflicts that were going on at the time. Like for those of you uh, who who don't know, she, you know, she heard Martin Luther King speak six weeks before he was jailed in Birmingham. You crossed the Berlin Wall at Checkpoint Charlie and visited families in East Berlin, right? Like when you stayed uh, with host families in Birmingham, they included the parents of a girl who was murdered at the bombing of the 16th Street uh, Baptist Church. And in college, you skipped your sociology midterm to drive overnight to Selma uh, to cross the Edmus Pettus Bridge on the way to Montgomery. And so I'm wondering if you can just sort of tell a story maybe that's in the book, maybe that didn't make it in about sort of what that experience was like for you. And I'm wondering if it sort of shaped the leader that you ultimately became. Certainly all of those experiences shaped me in profound ways. They were, again, escapes from the constraints of my childhood and expansions of my mind. The first one chronologically was the East German, Eastern Europe trip. And I was attracted to that. I just picked up a flyer at my school and it was organized by a Quaker group. And it was not long after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when we had as students all huddled together in a classroom wondering if the world was going to end and if our lives were going to end at that very moment. And that intensified my awareness of the dangers of the East-West divide. And this flyer said, kind of hands across the Iron Curtain, join in this group and speak to students and other people of your age and beyond in these countries that are supposedly our enemies. And I thought, well, I don't wanna sit around and wait for the world to blow up. I think this is something I, I could contribute. And so the trip involved uh, travel in three countries that as I say in the book, no longer exist. East Germany, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. And we have now a united Germany and a Czech Republic and Yugoslavia has splintered into a number of different um, uh, countries, individual countries. But it was a view of communism that expressed itself through human capacities and, and human embodiments. And when we talk to young people who, some of whom believe fervently in what communism might accomplish in terms of equality and, and justice, others who objected to it strongly and were hoping to figure out a way to cross the wall, which had been built just two summers before. Uh, and so it just was extraordinarily intense. Uh, 
everything seemed on the line in East Germany in particular, and Berlin was a kind of flashpoint within East-West uh, conflict. But I began to see all these different gradations. East Germany was very different from Yugoslavia, which under Tito had tried to be non-aligned rather than aligned with the Eastern Bloc, had tried to get out from Russian influence. And so there was a much more nuanced sort of approach to, to, to communism and socialism. And so I came home uh, thinking communism isn't monolithic, understanding a little bit of how people were thinking. And that, that has stayed with me ever since, as I've thought about that part of the world. I just went back to uh, two of those countries or two of those non-countries. I went to the Czech Republic and to Germany, uh, the new countries they've become this past summer and found the, the roots of, of where we are now very much still evident in, in how those countries were. So that was that was pretty transformative. And then the whole civil rights issue. I had become aware of injustices in the segregated Virginia society in which I grew up at an early age and wanted to commit myself to a different kind of um, social order. And so the summer after I did the East German um, trip, I was asked by the person who'd organized it if I would join a group of young people that he was going to take to some sites in the South where the American Friends Service Committee had been working with communities um, over the years, and we would go down and, and be kind of the youth brigade once again. Basically, we didn't do a very good job of reaching across the segregated walls of Southern society in that segregationists didn't want much to do with us. We were living with Black families. They saw us as dangerous especially when young women and young men, um, black and white, were together. That was the most frightening thing, I think, in, to um, Southern segregationists. And so we were in some occasions met with violence and threats. But for me, it, again, personalized the freedom struggle. When I stayed in a house in Birmingham with a family in which the nine-year-old had been arrested multiple times and was so proud of having been a warrior for justice and integration and civil rights. It, it rendered the entire reality of civil rights into terms of individual human beings as well as a society at large. So when I heard about Bloody Sunday, uh, when John Lewis and others had their heads beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma in the following March, I felt these are the people that I was with last summer, not literally, but Essentially, they were human beings with the same commitment to freedom, the freedom struggle, the same commitment to a better world and a better country. And I just thought, if I don't go, if I don't join the next march, I'll never forgive myself. I just won't be a human being worthy of consideration um, thenceforth. So that was the end of my sociology midterm and a, <laughs> a paper I wrote where the professor, when I came back from the march, it just had the most wonderful, searing comment from, from the professor about what a total mess this paper was. But I kind of bore it as my little badge of pride. But, right. But, that was uh, before you email a paper to your professor. You actually yes, have, to have somebody yes. else type it up and send it in for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, that's actually a really good segue into my next question, which is sort of the, there's a central theme in your book that's sort of this internal struggle that you have between confronting real world problems um, and your love for academia, right? And sometimes you grew a little frustrated a little bit because you felt it was so abstract in comparison. And you you write about how sort of the events that were happening in the world during your teenage years kind of kept pulling you back to a reality so it's more consequential than your adolescent life. And, you know, you for example, like JFK, right? He was inaugurated your freshman year um, and shot your senior year. You had friends and boyfriends who uh, the Vietnam War was sort of pulling them into military service. Um, and you you write um, in one place that college seemed to be all about me. My summer had been all about others. My academic work transported me to an ethereal realm of ideas. The civil rights movement was about action in the here and now. Studying often just seemed irrelevant. Um, and I find this fascinating, particularly, you know, because you ultimately did return to the world of academics. Um, and I'm wondering if you feel like that came at the cost of confronting real world problems, or if you felt like you found ways to confront them even still. 
such a profound question. It's like, what's the meaning of your life, Laura? So <laughs> no pressure. With it. No pressure. Well, first, I was always aware how education was liberating for me, that because I was very bright in school, I got to have this separate world of intellectual or cure curiosity and then intellectual inquiry. I won't say, you know, fifth grade was intellectual, but I just always could turn to books, could excel at something apart from being a Southern lady, which was the uh, expectation of me. I was a great student. And so that was a nice identity to have. And then it was through my experience in at Concord Academy and then at Bryn Mawr that I began to see a path forward, that education opened a life for me and a place for me. And so I was always very in awe of what education could do and recognize how important it was. And of course, the, the Brown v. Board decision that had set off the entire experience for me of, of civil rights in Virginia as a small child when, when that passed and the overt racism with which it was greeted opened my eyes. That was, of course, about education. So education always played an important role in my mind and in my life. But what unfolded, I think, was that as I moved through activism in my college years, two things. One, as it became more violent, as the anti-war movement became more violent, as SDS became not a uh, organization seeking participatory democracy, but rather one wanting to bring the revolution home, uh, it was just less congenial to me. I, I think I was very influenced by my experience with the Quakers. I always had a very uh, strong commitment to nonviolence. I was a king type civil rights person, um, uh, uh, front and center first and foremost. And so I began to feel more alienated from that part of activism. And of course, the civil rights movement divided also with um, SNCC becoming more committed to black power, expelling white members. And, and that also left me a little on the sidelines, not knowing exactly where to turn. At the same time, there was a growing sense that universities could be important agents of social awareness and social change. And so I did a lot within my college community about um, establishing rights for women and students. And it all sounds so pathetic now in terms of the silly things that that existed uh, in those years that seemed to us, us earth shaking. And just one example of this, I once said, um, I was involved in, in student government at Bryn Mawr and we eliminated rules that said women couldn't go out at night until, um, and spend overnights in Haverford. That's the um, men's college nearby. Couldn't stay in Haverford dormitories, couldn't do all kinds of other things. And we organized and basically got rid of all this. And so once I said to my daughter, she was approaching college age. I said, I abolish parietals, being very proud of having gotten rid of all this. She looked at me and said, what are parietals? <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's how trivial it seems in retrospect. But on the other hand, the fact that she didn't even know what it was right. see, suggests that we accomplished our goals. So yeah. I moved towards thinking about universities as organizations that were really important in society as well as places that expanded my mind and gave me an opportunity to pursue my intellectual interests. And I spent much of my time as an assistant associate full professor moving through those years at Penn, um, agreeing to be on every possible committee, but not saying I would ever take an administrative job. And so I thought I'm never taking an administrative job. I wanna stay in the classroom. And then I ended up at Harvard at the Radcliffe Institute and then as president of Harvard. So I guess I took on an administrative job, but I was always torn a bit between the uh, possibility for writing and intellectual inquiry and the importance of making sure that universities contribute to society in the ways in which they're capable of doing. Yeah. I'm wondering sort of like, uh, as you were just sort of saying, what your thoughts on there now, right? Because it feels like we're sort of in another moment where um, the challenges of the real world are evolving faster than the industry of higher ed. And you talk about in 1968, higher ed was facing a quote unquote crisis of legitimacy. And I think to some degree that's true now as well. And I'm wondering sort of what you feel like is the role of higher ed leaders to ensure that the industry is still tackling societal issues. 
I had the privilege last week of being invited to um, attend on Zoom a session with a group of new higher ed leaders, new presidents who were convening at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I delivered a little mini speech to them at the end of the session, just saying so much depends on you now, not just for your leadership of your individual institution, but for the crisis of higher education that is being perpetrated with attacks on universities, distrust of universities, uh, forces saying that a college education doesn't matter when clearly from all statistics, it does matter in terms of not just people's financial well-being, but their health, their citizenship, and that that is a false narrative being advanced. So I believe that a, a new higher education leader or any sitting higher education leader really is going to be pushed and pulled towards or eagerly embrace the necessity of taking this on and defending what has been one of the most important forces in American life. It, it has uh, contributed to so many accomplishments in the public realm, in the private realm. And also higher education has been one of the most outstanding elements of American society in the eyes of the world. We have been acknowledged to do it better than anywhere else. And are we gonna squander that leadership as well? I think it's a very dangerous time. Yeah. Um, and do you feel like higher ed is still a worthy pursuit for sort of young people like yourself who um, were, are very idealistic? Do you feel like it's still a worthy pursuit for them if they, if they want to tackle real world problems? I do. I do. It's a, it's a place where you can speak and think and persuade and undertake the very work of a democratic society, which is to use reason and judgment and participation to uh, move the society towards a better place. I taught a class on uh, the American South. Every year I was in the classroom. Uh, and that's, so that's mostly my years at Penn before I took on these administrative, I've been back in the classroom, but every year that I taught at Penn, uh, I did this big lecture class on the history of the South. And the first semester went up to the Civil War. The second one went Civil War to the present. And I had a chance to talk to students hundreds at a time about the history of the United States and its relationship, or before the United States, even the colonial period, its relationship with race, slavery, all those things that are now being questioned and, and challenged. I got to share those realities, that history, with dozens of people who are now out in the world being lawyers and doctors and business people and everything else. And I do think that it had an impact on a lot of them that they remember that class. A lot of them write and say, I remember that class. And I welcome that opportunity to open eyes and to make citizens or help make citizens. And in discussion classes, smaller classes, sometimes the effect could be even deeper as people really explored what they thought and shared it and challenged each other and argued and left being different from what they'd been at the beginning of the semester. And making that difference is extraordinarily rewarding and I would say extraordinarily important. Yeah. Um, you, in your youth, you were deeply involved, of course, in the the push for racial equality. And in the chapters about Concord Academy and Bryn Mawr, you remark on sort of at the time what a bubble those places were, right? Mm -hmm. They were spaces that were for white Anglo-Saxon um, Protestants. And, um, you know, now we're in this era where affirmative action is being dismantled and politicians in states across the country, right, are trying to um, attack efforts to make higher education less of a bubble, right? More more diverse, more inclusive. And so I'm wondering if you feel like the higher education industry needs to do more to make sure that those goals aren't lost. Well, the higher education industry is facing the necessity of doing more in face and doing differently in face of the overturning of affirmative action. Institutions like Harvard are deeply committed to a diverse student population and people like me who remember what education was like before there was such a diverse population are highly motivated to sustain those changes which have been so significant to the educational experience of students. But institutions are gonna to have to figure out, are figuring out right now, different ways to approach this without the tool of affirmative action. 
affirmative action really began to be enforced during the Nixon administration. So it was just after, not long after I graduated from college and really when I started graduate school. And I was a graduate student at Penn. And, I, and when I think about the impact that affirmative action had, even during the time I was in graduate school, 1970 to 1975, things really began to change. And so my whole life from the beginning of graduate school till now, which is a long time, 1970 was a very long time ago, we've seen this transformation and the idea that we now are losing the tool of that transformation and we're going to possibly be pushed back towards what it was like in 1970, that's so dangerous, not just in terms of equity, which is extraordinarily important, who comes to college and how and so forth, but also in terms of what it means to be in a group of people different from yourself and how important an element of education that that is. Yeah. Um, so in a recent interview with the New York Times, you reflected on your, uh, your time at Harvard, and you talked about your attempts to curb the influence of the all-male social clubs, um, an effort, right, that sort of uh, angered some alumni. And you, you said in the interview, it's my one a great regret that I didn't make more progress. Women are not supplicants for men's favor or should not be. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can talk about that, um, maybe sort of why you made that effort and why you think it largely failed. It failed because of court rulings that made the policy that we discussed. This happened after I, I finished my um, presidency. Court rulings that made the policy we had established one that could not be defended in court. And there were many alums who objected to the policy, wanted to support the final clubs who contributed generously to um, making uh, that court a court challenge possible. So that that's what ended the policy. What motivated me was what I said in the, in those words that you you quoted, which is to have all male clubs dominate the social scene in an institution where men and women are supposed to be equal, to have them have enormous resources, to line women up along Mount Auburn Street in Cambridge on a Friday or a Saturday or even a Thursday night to pick and choose among them which women will be admitted, which won't, at a time when we have made such efforts to diversify the student body in terms of uh, class and and wealth to bring in uh, a much broader economic spectrum of individuals, to have this kind of hierarchy and privilege and male dominance seem to me at odds with the mission of the college and the mission of the, of the university. And so those words about, I didn't like women being forced to be supplicants to get into the doors of the location of Harvard social life, that seemed to me just wrong. Yeah. Do you feel like, you know, so much has changed as you described, like parietals are no longer a thing. Like, what do you feel like are sort of the um, the things that haven't changed? What hasn't changed? Oh, my gosh, that's so interesting. Um, what hasn't changed in terms of social life or in terms of everything? Yeah, it seems like I feel like the final club, club sort of strike me as something from almost a different a yeah. different era and you were really trying to to move things forward and um ran up against just so many obstacles in doing that um and it, it felt like almost a, a time where we say like much has changed but also mm -hmm. some things some things have not well, I, I think one of the the things we've seen in recent months is a lot of writing about uh, economic privilege in institutions like harvard and ivy league schools and other you know, what are called elite sure. institutions that if you come from a well-resourced family, you're more likely to have SAT tutors. You're more likely to know how to put to, you're more like, likely to be in a school where you have a college counselor for heaven's sakes. I mean, many um, public schools now don't even have college counselors or have one for every 500 students. So you're likely to craft a better application. You're likely to have done all kinds of things be it squash training or travel or other things that make you look like an interesting applicant. And so we have to work very hard. And I know that the 
these institutions are committed to this, to be the place where talent um, comes regardless of financial background and circumstances. And clearly those, we haven't gone far enough on that. And, and that's an issue that I know is on the minds of many leaders of, of institutions like Harvard. Yeah. Uh, we have five minutes left, and I want to sort of uh, look to the future now. We've talked a lot about uh, where things have uh, have come from. Um, you know, your lifetime has been such incredible social change in the country and also within higher ed. And at the same time, right, like now there's still so much change. There's still so many um, really difficult issues that society is facing. And I think, you know, you mentioned your daughter, like, so I feel like sometimes young people are are thinking more about how much is left to do um, and, and not how much, you know, how far we've already come. So I'm, I'm wondering sort of what you think the next generation of higher ed leaders is going to need to focus on and sort of what are going to be the next changes that they're gonna be uh, confronting. Well, we've been talking about some of those, uh, the need to figure out how to respond to the affirmative action decision and maintain the educational foundation of diversity in higher education. So that's certainly one. I think the um, access and affordability issues are extremely important ones. And those are together and different access, who gets in, how can you reach out to, to find people who might not naturally think of coming or might not have the resources to pre prepare themselves well, either in terms of their schoolwork or in terms of how to apply. And then affordability, what is the cost of higher education and how do we um, try to contain costs so that it is affordable for ever, anybody, everybody. And that means both financial aid, but also cost. So those are all those are all realities. But there's so many other issues and ones that I have not dealt with or uh, and will not have to deal with. I haven't been president now for over five years, so that's quite a distance from the day to day. I know everybody is very. We, there was a session just before this one about AI and yeah. what AI means, and it was largely administrative, at least the part of it that I heard, but. What does it mean in the classroom? How does that transform our classrooms? And how do we continue to adapt? I think Zoom and the pandemic pushed everybody a little bit forward on the use of technology in higher education, but there's a long way to go with these with those questions. And then there's a fundamental question that troubles me in my soul, a kind of existential question. Is higher education entirely instrumental? Is it just about the skills that one needs to fill a job? Or is there a role in the realm of values, questioning, critical thinking, the humanities, communication, all the softer skills, all the softer insights, all the things that make a human being, not just an employee. And those are being pushed aside in, in many parts of higher education, seen as dessert or frills or unnecessary altogether. And I regard them as the most necessary and the most fundamental. And so I worry about how they get sustained in the future and supported uh, at a moment of so much upheaval and change. How do you do that? Because that's an interesting point. Like how 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 do those uh, get sustained? What should leaders be doing to make sure that, as you say, um, those things aren't lost? I think leadership can play an important role that insisting that these are fields that must be represented and must be strong, that Universities are meant to connect us to the future, yes, and to, to what we need to uh, understand about the future, but we need to have that understanding, incorporate elements of what has come before and how we define ourselves as human beings and can university leaders set that, that expectation and then ask those under them to execute on it with support for library resources, for humanities, um, concentrations and, and humanities departments to linking across fields so that the humanities are a part of medical training, for example. Medical training isn't just about poking bodies. It's about how to help people understand health and illness and suffering and death. And that's about a lot more than what goes on in a test tube or a laboratory or an operating room. So how can we 
enforce that, reinforce those values and make sure they get implemented across schools and curriculum. Yeah. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, Drew Faust's book, Necessary Trouble, is uh, is for sale now. Um, I recommend reading it. Thank you so much. It's been uh, thank great you, Laura. speaking with you. Take it care. It was really, really fun. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.